I think one of the, the things I think that is helpful is to recognize for many men, hiding, lying, and deception was their first coping strategy. It was their first attempt to create safety. And um, I often heard Mark talk about the coping strategies that we had first are the ones that are most difficult to give up. And so for many men, sexual addiction and that exposure to sexual material came much later. But even as little boys, they begin to see the dynamic of hiding and lying as a strategy to create safety. Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. We're happy to be with you today. I'm Randy Everett, your co-host. And as usual, we have Dr. Greg Miller, our host. Greg, how are you? I'm doing well. It's good to be here. Well, Greg, by special demand, <laughs> we have once again brought the the uh, the clinical director of Faithful and True. It's my favorite term. Jim Farm. Jim, how are you? I am doing good. I thought you were going to say from the bullpen, which means like, you know, I'm not the starting pitcher. Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, earlier, you were, before you were here, you were referred to as the talent. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So we've been eagerly awaiting your arrival. I'll have to check that with Kayla when we're done. Yeah, yeah well, Kayla's the one who said it. Yeah, so. Kayla was the one who was her quote. Okay. Greg and I just looked at each other and just said, Who's Fine. that? Who are they, who's she talking about? Yeah, well, we'll just, we'll just be here if you need us. So we're happy to be, to be back with all of you today and uh, we've got a really interesting uh, topic that we want to discuss today and uh, it kind of revolves around the subject of lying. Yes and specifically what we want to explore today is why we lie. Um, for many of us um, it's like our first language. We learned it growing up and if you've been paying attention to our podcast in the last several um, podcasts we have mentioned this. In fact um, we did a podcast when we did the series on rebuilding trust, specifically on if we're going to rebuild trust, we need to be a truth teller. That's one of the ways that we can do it. And instead of waiting for questions, we offer information. And then just recently, we did a podcast on um, some of the indications that a husband isn't committed to his recovery. And one of those was that he's not being honest about what's going on. And so we want to just take some time and really explore what causes this issue of hiding and lying and deception um, to be so challenging for many men who struggle with addiction and then even as they continue their journey of recovery, why they fall back to those old patterns? Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to do this because this is, you know, something that comes up quite often. I mean, not only in the individual recoveries, but quite frankly, a lot of times in the couple's recovery is that, you know, sobriety happens from the addiction, but this lying component continues to happen. And so I'm excited to talk yeah. about this, this well, why. I think one of the, the things I think that is helpful is to recognize for many men, hiding, lying, and deception was their first coping strategy. It was their first attempt to create safety. And um, I often heard Mark talk about the coping strategies that we had first are the ones that are most difficult to give up. And so for many men, sexual addiction and that exposure to sexual material came much later. But even as little boys, they begin to see the dynamic of hiding and lying as a strategy to create safety. And, um, you know, we have a lot of men who come through our workshop who identify that they come from a good Christian home. And what's also true is in a good Christian home, there can be patterns of deception or places where we're not completely authentic or ways that we don't share all of the information. And as a little boy, we observe that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. The hard thing about lying sometimes, because it is so much attached to our safety, that it literally gets hardwired into our stress response. Mm -hmm. So it's so reactionary rather than, you know, it's not something oftentimes that's well thought out. It's just an, an automatic lie. And I always kind of talk about sometimes it starts off and not so much something that we're lying that we might have done, but it may be about what someone else has done. Right. I kind of give this example from a client that I had a while back. Um, and it, it's, you know, I kind of say denial is kind of where I'm lying to myself. And so the, the, the case example really was where this, this man, when he was a little boy, um, he must, he was probably first, second grade and something had happened before school and his dad had actually taken a, a wood paddle and actually, you know, beat him so much that it, it cracked the wood paddle. And so when he was in school, um, 
you know, he bled through his pants and the teacher had asked him, you know, what had happened. And he, he lied about that. But the thing that he said in the, in the group when I was working with him is he said, well, I can understand why dad did that because I was such a bad kid. Mm -hmm. See, the only way he could deal with that his dad would beat him so much that he'd bleed through his pants was that he had to be a bad he kid. Rationalized right. He rationalized it. That's so he lied to himself in order to deal with that significant issue. Yeah. Well, I often say at the workshop, the lies that we say with the most confidence are the lies that we first believe. And so very much what you're saying, before I can lie to anybody else, I have to lie to myself. And this becomes incredibly complex when a child is raised in an environment where reality isn't acknowledged. And so uh, maybe you grew up in a home where a parent is depressed and nobody ever talks about the fact that the parent is depressed. And in fact, when you go out in public, the parent acts like everything is okay, or maybe especially when you show up at church, everything seems to be okay. But you get back home, the mom or the dad is depressed, but you're not able to talk about it. Or like in this case, you have a parent that has aggressive anger and is even violent, but you're not allowed to talk about it outside of the home. So early on as a child, we begin to learn if we can't live in reality, then we create an alternative reality that becomes the source of deception. And so it can be direct, it can be indirect, but if you grew up in a home where reality in some way wasn't acknowledged, then it makes sense you have difficulty staying grounded in the truth because hiding was a way to create safety or it was a fam family rule. We do not talk about these things or you do not acknowledge this in public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so... We think of denial is just associated with the, the addiction, but it's it's been there for quite a while, mm -hmm. you know. And the other thing that makes it so hard is, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is that um, the research actually shows that if you lie to either protect yourself or protect someone that you care about, your brain actually releases oxytocin. Mm. It's the bonding hormone. So it actually makes you feel safe. So in other words, it's almost reinforcing itself. Right. If I'm lying to protect myself, my brain actually starts the neurochemistry that says, do that again the next time you feel unsafe. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is, so what we, what we know is sometimes we lie in order to make an unsafe circumstance more safe, but then our body comes along with the neurochemistry and reinforces it. So it's safety externally in my circumstance, but then it's a sense of safety or well-being that's coming from my neurochemistry. So it makes perfect sense for that little boy. Lying is the way that we create safety externally and internally. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't have to be these big secrets. Um, I've heard so many stories where a man would simply acknowledge there were certain things in our household that we did not talk about. Uh, maybe it was somebody's divorce or maybe it was somebody's suicide. Mm -hmm. And so you observe like, oh, these are things that we don't talk about. And so in certain circumstances, hiding and lying is acceptable. You know, what's true is if a child sees an adult hide or lie or deceive about something, it sends them the message that it's okay, it's okay. in certain mm -hmm. circumstances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it is, all that to say, it's it's very difficult. And so we run into it quite a bit. And so... I don't know, you probably remember Mark saying this, but I, when I used to lead groups with them, I remember Mark kind of saying, you know, kind of the, the comment that you said earlier, but then he would often say, you got to learn to tell the truth and tell it faster. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Well, I would also say that, you know, for those of you that are listening, we are not in any way excusing someone's behavior if they are deceptive. Um, we are simply trying to create an understanding because what we know is if we can understand why we are doing something, then we can begin to change it. And so we're not giving anybody permission to lie, no matter what circumstance they're coming from. We know that the truth does set us free, even if it's difficult or painful truth. So that's the direction that we're going from or going towards. But what's also true is if you grew up in a home where hiding, lying, and deception was your first language, it was spoken all around you. Um, when we are in stress or crisis, we go back to what is familiar and that's why a lot of men, when they feel anxiety, they start hiding and they start hiding about stuff or lying about stuff that is really inconsequential. You know, I hear that a lot um, where a, a wife will say it was no big deal. If he had just told me about it, I would have been fine with it. But for whatever reason, something got triggered in him and he felt like that was a detail that he needed to keep back. Yeah. 
Yeah. What makes it harder is if you actually told the truth but experienced a significant consequence as mm-hmm. a result of that as a child. Right. I always tell this example. I don't know if I shared this with you guys, but when my oldest son graduated high school, he took this job. It was kind of like a construction job. And he comes to me, you know, after the first day and he goes, Dad, this guy, you know, he's willing to pay me like $15 more an hour if I have a truck. And I just, I just bought my truck. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know me, Randy, I'm kind of tight. I'm like, really? Well, 15 bucks <laughs> more an more. hour. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, you just take my truck all summer and I'll drive, you know, your little car around. And so I bet it was a month later. I'm, I drive, I drive, you know, kind of next to our, our, our driveway and I'm pulling in and I see him and my wife out in the driveway and my mind automatically goes, all right, he well, must've done something well, to, the to the truck and I'm looking at it and I don't see anything. And I'm like, oh crap, it must be really something bad. Cause I don't see anything wrong with the truck. And so I get out of the car and, and Nate comes up to me and he goes, dad, I got something to say to you. And I go, what? And he goes, well, can we go walk over here? And he walks to the other side of the truck. And I'm looking at my wife and she's like, you know, giving me the eyes, <laughs> you know, and Nate goes, you know, we, we accidentally, uh, the, the wheelbarrow got away from us and it literally slid all the way across the side of the truck. And in that moment, this is a divine moment. I'm thinking I'm irritated, but if I respond with irritation, what's the likelihood that he's going to be truthful with me again? Right. Mm-hmm. You know what right. I mean? And, and one of the things that we talk about is sometimes truth has consequences. That's right. And so it's not about avoiding the consequences. And even truth that has consequences still sets us free. Um, you know, we often talk about trying to manage the outcome. And one of the reasons that we hide and lie or deceive is we're trying to manage somebody's reaction. We're trying to avoid what we perceive would be a negative or a hurtful reaction. And it's important for us to recognize that it is in our truth telling, even if it is painful truth, um, that there can still be hope and healing. And we often say truth can be hurtful. Truth is never harmful. It's the hiding and lying and deception that is harmful. And for a man that created safety as a child through hiding and lying and then began to act out secretly, that deception piece becomes even more important. I I often say part part of my story is there was a season when I was in elementary school and junior high that I shoplifted. And I was fairly successful at it. I never got caught at it. <laughs> it was actually I, pretty good. I think, you know, part of the deal is I looked fairly innocent you as a prior? little boy. Yeah. Um, and what also what is also true is the entire time I was actively in church, and it never entered my mind to go tell somebody at church what I was doing because I intuitively knew that what I was doing was wrong and that there probably would be a strong reaction. And so that reinforced the secrecy of it. Well, I often hear the story of young men who are first exposed to pornography when they are children, when they are young, and immediately their shame gets triggered and their shame sends them into secrecy and isolation. And that's another reason why um, we can be so fluent in the language of hiding, lying, and deception is if we're involved in something that we know there's going to be a negative reaction to, we're going to keep it a secret. And if we're involved in something that is triggering our shame, one of the coping strategies to manage our shame is to go into secrecy. And so part of the work that we have to do is kind of push against the shame because the alternative to shame is truth. If shame are the lies I believe about myself and God, then the alternative to shame is truth. And that's what we're moving towards. Yeah. Yeah. And so that makes it extremely difficult for someone who grows up in a more of a performance based environment Mm -hmm. because you, you, the love is conditional then. Right. If I don't perform well, then that love's going to be, you know, pulled away from me. So of course I'm going to lie because I don't want to be seen for the mistakes I've made. Right. Well, and um, if you've been around for a while, you've heard me talk about the research that I did. And one of the things that we evaluated was what I referred to as performance based faith. Because we had all these men coming through the workshop that were saying, I don't know why I'm here. I I come from a good Christian family. What we begin to discover is it's not kind of did you discover faith or were you exposed to faith, but what was the context or the the aspect of faith that you were exposed to? And one of the things that we see in performance-based faith is that righteousness is defined by somebody's behavior. What we know from the Bible is righteousness is about God. It's not about me. Mm-hmm. It's about God and God's character and God's nature, not my choices or behavior. 
But if you grew up in a church environment that if you were righteous because you did good things, or maybe you even went to a faith tradition that gave you stars or rewards if you made a good choice, it's constantly reinforcing this idea that God wants me to be good, therefore I must hide what is bad in order to be loved by God, because that's what I'm experiencing in the context of my faith. And it becomes very complicated to begin to untwist those knots that have been created. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the importance of why we we do groups so much or we do this workshop that we're going to start tomorrow is where guys can share maybe not the so beautiful aspects of their story, but, you know, love isn't pulled out from beneath them as a result of that. that right. They actually will find acceptance by actually revealing, sharing some of the things that you kind of describe, which you always change the percentage every month. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it fluctuates. <laughs> that, that 20, 15, 10%, whatever that is, that, you know, they haven't shared before. Right. Well, so. and, you know, one of the things that we talk about is if we're going to shed our shame, the way that we do that is we experience truth in safe community. Um, that idea that shame is created in community Therefore, shame is shed in community. And so it is about finding safe people where I can begin to tell my truth in a way that I've never been able to do it before. And again, uh, this isn't an excuse for someone's hiding and lying. And we also want to acknowledge for a spouse that is deceived and lied to, that is incredibly painful. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard my wife say it. I've heard Deb say it. That you know, the, the sexual betrayal is incredibly painful. And what can be even more painful is the deception piece. And so, you know, that's commitment to being honest. I love that thing that Mark would say is we've got to learn to tell the truth more quickly. Yeah. Because the longer, and I've even experienced this in my own journey, the longer we hold on to something, then the more difficult it becomes to actually share it. But again, when we feel threatened, we go into that hiding. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that we deny the truth. One of them is kind of what we've talked about is that bold faced denial where somebody says, is this yours? Did you do this? And you go, no, 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 that's not mine. Another way though we deny is by minimizing. So we acknowledge it and yet we make it sound like it's no big deal. You know, if we're talking about pornography, yes, I've seen pornography, but not that often, or it's not that important to me, but we're minimizing the significance of it. Mm -hmm. um, another way though that we do it is we rationalize it. And I think that this is a, a very deceptive way to deceive, where we are able through some sort of distorted logic make sense of what it is that we are doing, and then that gives us permission to do it. Mm -hmm. And then the other way that we deny the truth is by justifying what we're doing, which is about entitlement. I deserve to do this. Mm -hmm. and so yes, yeah, sometimes we have a bold-faced denial, and yet there's a lot of ways that we can massage the truth in such a way that like we're talking about we try to create safety yeah yeah and one of the things i do want to kind of share before we get done with this podcast is there's lying by omission too mm -hmm. you know sometimes people just think of lying as well you ask me a question i'm just going to outright lie to you well there's also that element of well i know you'd want to know this greg but you know since you didn't ask i'm not going to tell you right or you didn't ask and i've heard deb say this one of the the things that creates chaos for a wife is if she only knows things because she's asking questions, well, then the fear is always, I'm not asking the right, right questions. questions. Mm -hmm. And so I get to interpret your question in such a way that I get to share what it is that I'm, I'm comfortable sharing. And so, you know, and again, if you grew up in a home where certain things were not talked about, where reality was omitted, you know, we didn't talk about dad's alcoholism, or we didn't talk about mom's anger, or we didn't talk about our financial chaos. Whenever an illusion was created through omission, then it makes perfect sense. That's one of your go-tos. Again, I feel safe when I don't talk about this. And what can also be true is there's this old message of I am actually betraying the family by talking about this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up in my home, one of the things that I was aware of was there were certain things that we talked about and there were certain things that we didn't talk about. And I often talk about one of our family rules was if you love someone, you protect them from your pain. And another way to interpret that is if you love someone, you protect them from the truth. If the truth is painful, if the truth is difficult mm -hmm. and you don't want somebody to hurt, then an expression of love is hiding. And so once we start looking at kind of how our family 
did truth or didn't do truth, then that gives us insight into how we're showing up now and some of the changes that we're going to need to make. Yeah. One of the things I just want to kind of bring an example in because I want to give the, the listeners kind of an idea when I talk about telling the truth and telling it faster, what that looks like. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. So I may have actually shared this before, but it, it, this this example always just you know stands out to me. It was a couple that I saw years ago and the couple came in and said, we just, we don't even understand this. The guy was actually admitting that. Like, I don't even know why I'm lying about this stupid stuff. But mm-hmm. the example was, you know, she was looking for a bag of potato chips that she had bought at the grocery store. And so she goes downstairs because he's watching TV and asks him, well, do you know what happened to that bag of potato chips? And he goes, nope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she knew fair, right, right away that he had probably eaten that whole bag of potato chips. P- potato chips. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> right. Covered in evidence. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Well, we get into his story, and, and quite frankly, it was, you know, he had to do a lot of lying to survive his childhood, right? And so I shared with him you know, kind of what we've already talked a lot about here today is that that's kind of an automatic reaction. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, the wife would admit she comes in hot. You know, right. we talked about, you know, <laughs> come, in yeah. Yeah, come in hot, like accusatory type thing. Yeah. And so one of the things that we talked about was, you know, telling the truth and telling it faster. And so... Um, they come in probably, you know, three weeks later and I go, how's it going? Wife goes, well, he did it again. <laughs> and I go, what did he do again? Well, he lied about the potato, the, you know, the bag of potato chips. But here's what she, she says. But he chased me up the stairs and caught me halfway up mm. and said, hey, I lied to you. I did eat the whole bag of potato chips. And so that's the idea of being able to change and respond differently. Yeah. So he recognized that instantaneous reaction when she came in hot was, I'm going to protect myself. But that time in between she turned away and walking up the steps, he realized, oh, that is not what I want to do. So he started to tell the truth and tell it faster. Right. You know, one one of the things that is helpful is to be able to recognize when I hear a question as an accusation. Sometimes it may be presented that way. It feels more like an interrogation than just a conversation. So even if someone is coming in hot, what happens is this younger part of me shows up. And in this particular case that you shared, he's a grown adult man. He can eat potato chips if he wants. He can buy potato chips if he wants. And maybe he did eat the potato chips and he can run to the store and buy some more potato chips. But that question lands in this younger part of him. So it's this little boy who's showing up. And in my own journey in this recovery, that's one of the things I became aware of is a lot of times questions landed in me, whether they were intended or not, as an accusation or an interrogation. Mm -hmm. And I had to begin to reacclimate myself to say, okay, even if my first reaction is to not be honest about this, I do have to push through that. And yeah, sometimes it's about potato chips, but what's also true is sometimes it's about more relational things, maybe how somebody is feeling. I know early in recovery, Beth would ask me, you know, what's going on for you? How are you feeling? Or, you know, you seem upset or angry. Well, I was so used to denying my feelings. My first, I mean, my instantaneous response is, oh, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, nothing's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, And many times I had to, you know, rush up the stairs in our own version and go back to Beth and say, actually, I wasn't honest. I am anxious about this or I um, feel sad about this. And so, Even in those simple, what appear to be simple conversations to some people, there is so much complexity complexity, um, to being able to get connected to what it is that you're feeling and to be able to share that. So sometimes it's about sharing information. Sometimes it's about being more honest and authentic about what's going on with us. Um, One of the ways that we hide and lie is through isolation. You know, we've had a difficult day at work. We are feeling overwhelmed. Maybe we did get some sort of reprimand from our boss, but we feel like we have to contain that and can't bring that home. Well, that is a form of hiding. Mm -hmm. And um, the image that I use is growing up, I learned to be the illusionist where I'd get you to look over here, but all the good stuff was happening over here. And it was hiding through distraction. Mm -hmm. And I learned if you, this is kind of the, if you share most of the truth, then people assume it's all the truth. And then you get to hold this back. And so many of us are good at showing or sharing 90% of it or 85% of it, depending on what the percentage is. And sometimes we only share 60% of it. 
But yeah. we believe that if we share some of it, then that gives us permission to hide more of it. And that also leads the other person to believe maybe they have it all. That's right. That's right. And the potato chip company is guilty because they were the ones that said, I bet you can't eat just one. <laughs> I still wonder what kind of potato chips that guy yeah, was eating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Must have been good. <laughs> well, and I do think, you know, one of the things that you, you mentioned it, but it's worth emphasizing again, I've had so many men, and it's been true in my own story, where I would hide and lie something that really was not that significant. Yeah. But, but I do think if you grew up in an environment where you learn to hide and lie to be safe, or you were taught to hide and lie to protect the family, then your your first thought is, can I talk about this? Can I acknowledge this and still be safe? Um, I One of the images that I use for myself is growing up, it was like I had a five second delay. Yeah. And you know, if you've ever watched live entertainment, it's not live. There's a little bit of a delay so that if something happens and they need to cut quickly, they can. But that's how I lived my life. And in those five seconds, I was assessing the threat. I was determining how I needed to respond. I was trying to determine how much to share. And if I was really good at it, you didn't even know there was a delay. But in that time, I was filtering out, filtering out from my own perspective what could be shared, what couldn't be shared, what the consequences might be, all of that. And yeah. so yeah. It, part of it is learning to just show up in the moment with whatever is true yeah. But if you didn't grow up in that space, it is a skill that you have to learn. Yeah. That that couple that I worked with, one of the things I did with them is because she admittedly said, yeah, I do come in hot, is I, I encouraged her to give him, you know, a few seconds, you know, seven to 10 seconds. And what I had him do is actually just remind himself that that, that automatic reaction, it's a brain pathway. It doesn't mean he's a bad person. Mm -hmm. And to remind himself, you know, of what we kind of talk about is, you know, not the little boy, but the wise man. Mm -hmm. That I can respond from that wise man. And within that 10 seconds, remind himself of those two things so that he could start to tell the truth a lot faster. Right. And that helped a lot for, for them as a couple. Actually. Absolutely. Because if there's a perceived threat, then we go into that little boy chair and then that survivor strategy shows up in some way to protect that little boy. And typically we do need to intentionally move to the wise adult chair and have conversations and reactions from that space. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, this has been a great conversation about uh, this uh, hot topic and remembering that denial is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> um, and I, I want to say it one more time. This is not an excuse for hiding, lying and deceiving. It's right. an understanding and so if we can understand it, we can change it. That's and right. We know that in order for there to be an intimate relationship, there has to be honesty and authenticity. And that's the goal. Yeah. It provides the opportunity for, for the change to happen. Absolutely. So, Pearls of wisdom. <laughs> Love it. Well, we want to thank you for joining us today on the Faithful and True podcast. Jim, as always, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Greg and I really enjoy these opportunities yeah. uh, to visit with you and get your uh, experience and uh, expertise, and uh, it's uh, it's always fun. The uh, if you've listened to this podcast today and it's opened to your eyes to maybe uh, a, a, an ongoing uh, trail of uh, lies uh, in your life, uh, don't despair. Uh, in fact, we are here to help with uh, such subjects as well. We invite you to visit faithfulandtrue.com where we've got many uh, resources available to you with over 400 podcasts like this one. That's no lie. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we You're want... an old guy since you've been doing it this long. Uh, <laughs> this feels like I've been doing it for forever. This particular podcast. This, <laughs> this, this, <laughs> This is the podcast that won't end. Uh, we, uh, we do invite you, though, to visit faithfulandtrue.com. And, you know, if you've come to the realization that you are struggling with unwanted sexual behaviors or struggle with pornography, we invite you to look into the information that's available about the Men's Journey Workshop. It's all on our, our website and online registration is available or you can call us here at our office the numbers on the website as well and uh, consider coming to our monthly men's journey workshop it is a transformational 
experience and the men that come here uh, we hear back from them often and uh, it really has made a huge difference in their life so until we join you again next week we hope that this coming week will be a week for you that's filled with many blessings and with great vision.